Thank you. Uh, good morning and welcome. My name is Michael Rosen and I am the regional board chair for ADL in Orange County and Long Beach. Um, so today we find ourselves at a reckoning moment in our society determining how we see each other and how we treat each other. And this past week has seen our nation's collective fury over the brutal killing of George Floyd under the knee of the police and the painful outcry that this cannot stand. We didn't know when we scheduled this forum that we would be in the midst of such a storm, but there is an intersection between our forum's topic and the anger in these protests. What kind of society do we want to have? How do we engage our diversity, our differences, our perspectives, our values? And what kind of conversation do we want to have? We have differences in even how we want to handle the conversation, both in person and online. We need more than statements, we need action. And we best honor George Floyd's memory by working to fight racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and all forms of hate. And that is our mission at ADL, and it's also the mission of our many co-sponsors for this forum for whom we are grateful for their partnership. So today we have a dynamic panel. If we had planned with foresight, we would have pulled together other representative voices. But nevertheless, our topic is extremely relevant as we explore the role of online speech to harass, to radicalize, to incite, and to threaten. So let me start by uh, introducing our panelists. Lenora Clare is an actress, an art creator, a casting director, an activist, and an advocate. She became an advocate or an activist against online hate after being targeted herself and harassed and stalked online. She works to promote safety and respect for the vulnerable and victimized across all of her various creative projects and platforms. And David Kay, is a clinical professor of law at the University of California, Irvine. He started his career as a lawyer for the State Department and he currently works with the United Nations. His most recent book explores the ways in which companies, governments, and activists struggle to define the roles for online expression. And our conversation will be moderated by Peter Levy who's ADL's Orange County, Long Beach Regional Director. And Peter, I'll hand it over to you now. Great, thank you, Michael. And I'm delighted that so many of us have joined us for this important webinar uh, at this time in our history. Uh, what's going on in our country right now is certainly weighs heavy on our hearts and our minds. And even in the midst of uh, this uh, racial, uh, trauma that we're going through, we see the weaponization of speech. And this is something that's not new between political correctness and race baiting and terrorist incitement and the internet's dissemination of extremism and hate and yes, fake news. It seems like people on all sides of the political spectrum are upset with speech and its excesses. And our topic today is really what can be done about it uh, and get a deeper understanding with some of our experts. So our flow today will be uh, each of our experts will have an opportunity to do a brief presentation, then we'll have a conversation and we'll open up to questions from you, our participants. So we're gonna start off uh, with Lenora Clare uh, to share a bit of her story and narrative. Hello everyone, um, thank you ADL for having me and sharing this platform, especially during this um, incredibly important time. Uh, before I tell my story, I just wanted to share a really quick anecdote because I feel it's so relevant and it's about the first time that I went to the police for help with my situation. I had gone after receiving really horrific uh, graphic rape and death threats. I was, it was to my shock, the police were incredibly dismissive of everything. And it just so happened that I went to lunch the next day with my friend Zarin and I was retelling what happened. I'm emotional. I'm, I'm telling him I went to the police for help. You know, I'd go as far as they, they, they mocked me, they discredited me, nothing happened. And he looked right at me 
and there was this sort of this look and he just, he couldn't help it, he, he laughed. My friend laughed at me and I, I stood up for a second, I, why is my friend laughing at me? And then it struck me, I had just told my friend, a black man, that I had gone to the police for help and it didn't work out as I had intended. And that made me so, it just talking about privilege and slapping you in the face and your awareness of it. So the reason why I bring up this story besides the fact that what's happening now is so critical is that everything I'm about to share, I'm a person who's coming from a place of privilege upon privilege. So when I tell this story and you know, I, it might be really shocking to a lot of you, I just want everyone to understand that this is how it is with someone with privilege. So just try and, and consider what this might be for someone who, who doesn't have that. So as we get into my story, it starts in 2011. I work in television now, but at the time I'd opened up an art gallery, I was incredibly proud. I'm a native Angelino. I was named one of the LA Weekly People of the Year. I say that not to give myself kudos because it's relevant to my story. Uh, what had happened is there's a schizophrenic man named Justin Masler, legally changed to Cloud Star Chaser. I mentioned that he's schizophrenic. I want it to be very clear that I'm not stigmatizing anyone with mental illness. It's just important to understand as part of the story, just as much as it's equally important to understand he's also an incel, and we'll get into that in a minute. So it's 2011, I've opened this art gallery, I've gotten a lot of press. Justin Masler is terrorizing Ivanka Trump of all people in New York, multiple arrests, he tried to kill himself in her store, dangerous individual. He jumps bail, he comes to Los Angeles, he sees the LA Weekly, he sees my profile, he becomes intrigued, he comes to the gallery, he walks up to me, we have very minor conversation, he seems intelligent, he's wearing a spacesuit, which isn't so abnormal for an art gallery. He looks right at me and he says, you look like Jessica Rabbit. Said, okay, I hear that sometimes. And then very intensely looks at me and he says, and I'm gonna stalk you. And at first I, I thought he was kidding, I pushed him out of the gallery, I didn't think a whole lot of it. The next day, I see on the news that, again, 2011 Trumps have hired bounty hunters to extradite this individual to New York to stay on trial for crimes towards Ivanka. So he's, he's in jail. He starts sending me these wild, insane ramblings. At first, it's disturbing, but as it starts to escalate, it rapidly turns into incredibly graphic, very explicit rape and death threats. And because of his schizophrenia, it will fluctuate between where he's in love with me and we're married to, because I'm Jewish, I'm the head of a Zionist conspiracy, therefore he has to gas me through my door with Zyklon B because that's how my relatives are. It's this whole really horrific fantasy. So as all this starts happening, I'm, I'm gathering all this evidence and I think, okay, I have, you know, tweets, I have emails. It could not be more clear that this man is threatening my life in the most violent and aggressive way. I bring it to police and police, the LAPD, Northeast Division, they look at me and they say, we think maybe if you dyed your hair, that might help, you know, put you less at risk and get off the internet. That was their solution for me, which I was absolutely horrified. I explained to them, you know, Ivanka's conventional looking, my appearance has nothing to do with it. So then I sort of sat with that information. And then as we'll get into the difficulty with restraining orders and all of that. So as I'm getting these rape threats, death threats, I'm teaching myself every day how to track his IP. So, because he's a, he's a wealthy individual who travels around the country. So I have to elevate, I have to know how, how much risk I'm at. So eventually I, so you know what, I've had enough of this. This is just, this is too much. This is what, how people have to live. I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I decided to go public. And the first time I went public with my story, I did a show called Crime Watch Daily, which teamed me up with an incredible woman who some of you may know. I know there's a lot of lawyers in this group. Her name is Rhonda Saunders, and she was the ADA at the time uh, here in Los Angeles when Rebecca Schaefer was murdered. And she got some of the first stalking laws passed in not just California, but the entire country they passed in 1991. And so we started a wonderful friendship and I started working with her and coming up with some of my own legislative proposals. And through you know taking my story and making it public, um, I wanted to first, stalking and cyber stalking are so widely misunderstood. And part of the reason is that I'm an anomaly with stalking. It's, I think the stats are 7.5 million Americans. I'm one of the 3% where it's not relationship gone wrong. This is, you know, which is why it's relevant to this with all the cyber stalking elements. So I start working with Rhonda. I started working with Congressman Schiff, which who has been an incredible ally through all of this. Um, and as, I'm, my story is getting out there. Vice calls me there in Brockovich of stalking, which then leads to 
you know, more stories and more media about my story specifically, which I knew I had to use my privilege because a lot of people who have this crime, they're not, if you're being stopped by your ex-husband, you don't have the luxury to do that, right? It's, it's different. Plus, my story is so celebrity adjacent, I knew that I would get attention. So then I start doing more media and then it starts making me realize I'm now getting, this is no joke, hundreds of people coming to me for help and I'm helping them navigate law enforcement how to serve them and I realize there's such a need for this right now. Um, I start working with social media companies, which we're going to obviously talk about where, what, what we can do to help with that sort of situation. Um, and so then as my case is developing this entire time, I'm helping others and nobody's helping me. I need to be very clear about that. I'm still getting very graphic, very explicit rape and death threats. Then it gets to the point where my stalker writes my boss a death threat. I lose my job because that's what they do. They're, they're emotional terrorists. They come and they just try and infiltrate every aspect of your life. So now I'm out of work. Everything is just completely miserable. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to take this opportunity and do an episode of 48 hours, which we're going to, we're going to, I think, show the clip now. So I want people, the reason why I'm showing this video is because I want people to understand that I'm somebody who had evidence upon evidence. I have the thing that nobody has, which is their stalker on national TV admitting to what they're doing. And I still had all the difficulty that I had. Yes, I absolutely would hurt people with no qualms and no apologies. I could kill people with my bare hands, are you kidding me? Or I'm an extremely fucking dangerous person. You know, I'm Jesus Christ, I'm a God and I have real divine powers. And yes, I will fucking take the law into my own hands. Does Lenora Claire have a reason to be afraid of you? You're damn right I'm a scary fucking person. I terrify the fucking shit out of people. Yeah, a lot of restraining orders are not legal though. It is, it is morally justified and legal to break that law. Lenora Claire wants you to stop sending her stuff. Right. She's part of the Zionist network. And they got all these girls that have me fucking framed out to be crazy when I'm really the Messiah. People need to learn that I don't have a lot of respect for fear. Lenora Claire's story is, is basically all lies. When she said there were rape threats, that was a parody film concept I sent her. If Lenora Claire is going to be a Zionist, a part of like a Zionist conspiracy, then we've got to find a way to get her out of social power. Can't have like women like that fucking up our social matrix. Like man up a little bit, you know? Those restraining orders aren't legal. I will not stop sending them. I will use the power of God to fucking destroy anyone who opposes me. I will not stop and I will fucking destroy you. So try stopping me. You die. I will kill them all. They will die. You will not stop me from sending messages. And if you try, you will die. I will not stop sending emails. So Lenora Claire, I will kill you. I will destroy you. So thank you for sharing. Now you can, you can see, now imagine every day of your life, that particular individual, that rage, creating websites about killing and raping you, right? Going to the police and at this point, so we film the 48 hours, they interview him, they get him put into an institution in Utah and finally getting a break from what's, cause this, at this point, this is, to, this is about to be 2016. Um, 2016, so then he's put into a mental institution. A week later, Trump wins. We're just sort of processing that. I get a call from Secret Service. It turns out my stalker had broken out of the mental institution. He was then caught a block away from Trump Tower. I thought he'd get some decent crime. It turns out in New York, they don't even have felony stalking. It's just treated as a misdemeanor there. Um, he comes to LA and has the intention of kidnapping me. I start working with the Kardashians because he was stalking them as well. And LAPD, nobody, no one is taking the fact that I'm getting these very clear threats online and that it is coming into the real world. No one is believing me. I, I have evidence upon evidence. I am a very credible individual. So my stalker comes to LA. He sends me an email and tells me he intends to kidnap me from the Los Angeles Comic Con. He doesn't know that I know the owners. So I set up an operation where I had uh, security come as Batman and Superman. When he came to kidnap me, they held him down. He was arrested. Um, then the Kardashians and Gwyneth Paltrow, he tried to kidnap her children. This is what I'm saying. I'm trying to tell people that these threats are so real. This individual's this dangerous and all this is allowed to transpire because nobody's listening to me. So I was able to get him on felony stalking max, which is something that a lot of people don't get, right? I got the thing that most people don't even get. And thanks to Proposition uh, 57, which was passed in 2016, which made certain crimes nonviolent, which include rape of an unconscious person, hate crimes, very relevant to all this, and stalking. My stalker who should have had four years, it was turned into two. That's not good behavior, it's automatic. 
Uh, he was released in December. It was already violated three times and here we are today. There's a lot that I had to gloss over my story because we have so much to talk about. So I hope I did a decent job uh, condensing it and then we can get into the nuanced stuff when everyone else speaks. Um, well appreciated, Lenora. And uh, you know, so no one should experience what you've experienced and continue to experience. And I know when we get into the conversation, we're gonna hear more about your uh, legislative efforts and your activism to really make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. But we're gonna jump now uh, to David Kay, uh, who is our expert from a legal perspective about the uh, free speech and expressions and the internet and how uh, that uh, plays. Thank you, Peter. Um, thanks to everybody for joining. Thanks especially uh, to the ADL for organizing and sponsoring this event and, uh, and to all the other sponsors. Um, I especially want to thank Lenora for opening up this discussion in the way that she did, which I think is extremely important because, you know, I think we're going to talk today about issues that have, have a kind of a legal and a policy angle to them. But at the end of the day, we're talking about real life harms. Um, and, and oftentimes we talk about hate speech online or harms online as if, you know, it's just sort of this virtual world of, of pain and fear and attacks when there are very real implications for safety of people for things that happen online. So, um, so I want to thank Lenora for really setting us up with that, that discussion. Um, so I'm going to share my screen right now and, and try to go through in nine minutes and 15 seconds that I have left, according to what Peter told me, um, really quickly through um, what I want to talk about in, 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 the, in the context of thinking about who should be deciding the big questions around hate speech online. Should we want companies to be making these big decisions about, about what some consider to be political speech, what some consider to be free speech? What governs them? Should we want governments to be deciding what's legitimate to say and not to say that that um, that kind of idea goes pretty firmly against a long tradition of the way we think about freedom of speech in the United States. Um, should there be other tools that we have available to us? So, so this is what I'm going to try to talk about, and I'll try to do it in a very um, in a very quick way here. So, what I want to do is is suggest that we talk first about companies and what they do, second about governments and then give you a little bit of a framework from, from human rights law, which is the international law that, uh, that is really the focus of, my, of mo most of my work. So, so companies, as I think most of you may know, they, they govern their own space. We say that companies moderate speech while governments regulate speech. So what does company moderation look like? It involves rules where they flesh out their terms of service. That is what you can and cannot do. I'll get to, to our hate speech example in a second. They have tens of thousands of moderators. These are individuals who are sitting behind screens and when a user flags content or when their algorithm highlights content for them, they look at it and decide whether to ignore that content or to delete it. They, and there's automation, right? These are companies that for the most part are at enormous scale. Uh, you know, when you think about Facebook, we're talking about about two and a half billion users. So um, when you think about Twitter, we're talking about um, a little less than 350 million users. So even if a tiny percentage of the content on their platforms is problematic, it's still a huge amount of, of content that might be problematic. So what did their rules look like? If you look at their rules, um, and I'm just focusing on hate speech, they have they have rules that deal not only with hate, but with um, privacy interferences, the kind that Lenora was talking about related to stalking, uh, related to doxing, that is the publication of the private information of users. They have all sorts of rules around harassment and so forth, many of which they've been pretty bad at um, enforcing over the years, but, but they do have these rules. If you look at Facebook, this is from Facebook's community standards. They, they say they don't allow hate speech and they define hate speech as direct attacks on people based on what they call protected characteristics, which as anybody who's familiar with the ADL would, would understand what we're talking about, race, religion, gender, sexual identity, and so forth. 
similar kinds of rules are um, can be found on YouTube's guidelines. They have um, they have rules against the um, the posting of videos or other kinds of content that it, that involve hateful content. And of course, Twitter also has a hateful conduct policy. They call it conduct. It's not hate speech. It's conduct, as if what you're doing on the platform um, actually has a, a kind of physical element to it, not just the intangible that we might think of as speech. So the companies have rules. They don't enforce them in the most transparent way, but they definitely do have rules. And I know that there will be questions which we can talk about in Q&A, which is how do these rules apply to individuals such as the President of the United States or to other political actors around the world who might actually engage in hate speech, but but also have a kind of public role so that the companies might say, even though it's problematic speech, set us of their rules. What do governments do? Governments regulate, right? So this isn't really true necessarily of the United States as much, but around the world, governments are pushing back. It's starting to change in the United States, but governments are pushing back. They're making direct demands on the companies to take down content. They are um, asking the companies, this is particularly true in Europe, to adopt codes of conduct so that they will, um, they will adopt their own rules in a more and apply them in a more robust way than they are around things like hate speech, um, terrorist content, so-called extremist content, other kinds of content that, that governments don't like to see. And also, I think importantly, um, in addition to what, the, the, what governments are doing with respect to the platforms, they're also criminalizing what users are doing. So this isn't necessarily the case in democratic countries, but in repressive countries around the world, we do see governments often criminalizing even criticism of government. And sometimes governments will say that that criticism of us is actually a form of hate speech. Um, and then finally, they are moving towards putting liability on the companies for harmful content, unfortunately. And what that means is they are saying that the companies are going to be liable for the content that is posted by third parties, that is by users. Um, in principle, that might not be so problematic if you can't get access to the individual who posted, but governments are by and large not identifying, not defining harm in very clear ways. And so it creates a whole mess of problems, both for, for governance uh, and for, for the companies in deciding what they can do. Now, in the United States, I'm speaking fast. I know there's a lot of information here. In the United States, companies are generally not liable for the content that's posted by, by users. This is under, and you may have seen this over the last week, under um, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. We could talk a little bit about that in the Q&A, but basically, I think the, the takeaway is in the United States, there's not much regulation around content unless it's um, child uh, endangering uh, kind of content or, or privacy interfering content like doxing, as I said before, although even there, not so much, um, and terrorist content. Um, around the world, however, governments are making legal requests of, of the companies all the time. Twitter has a transparency report that they issue every year, as do the other companies. And we can see that there are increasing numbers of, of complaints of demands imposed by governments against the companies, oftentimes, again, for what we might imagine to be illegitimate reasons, uh, often around um, things like governments unhappy with the nature of public debate on the platforms. Germany, you might have heard, adopted a couple of years ago what's known as the, as the Nets DG. Um, the act, uh, it's, it's, we call it in English the Network Enforcement Act. In German, it's like a full paragraph word, of course. Um, but this is a law that basically says to the platforms, you need to apply our hate speech laws. So for example, in German law, it's illegal to display the Nazi swastika or other Nazi symbols. They're saying to the companies, you need to apply our law on your platforms, which in principle might not be so problematic, 
but there's no intermediary kind of court that, inv that is involved in doing that. They're basically saying to the companies, here's a German law, you need to apply it. And we're seeing that in other places uh, as well. Uh, France just adopted a law that will have a similar kind of mechanism. Okay, so you've got companies moderating content, you have governments increasingly wanting to regulate content. Where does that, act, where does that leave us as individuals? Our tools are pretty limited. I, I imagine that Lenora would tell you how difficult it is often to get the attention of the companies. I mean, it may be different when you have a certain kind of profile, um, a public profile, but for the vast majority of users who can only flag content um, for the platform, it's very hard for them to get the attention of, of the company um, or of any of the companies. Now, there because I'm really at, at 10 minutes, uh, which is what I promised Peter, but international human rights law, which actually binds the United States, the United States is a party to one of the central treaties in human rights law, actually gives us some ideas for how to think about hate speech, not just in, in public, but hate speech online. So Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights gives everyone the right to freedom of expression, and then it also says that governments, you'll see this in paragraph three down here, governments may subject freedom of expression to certain kinds of restrictions. They have to be provided by law. That means it has to be clear. It can't just be the government decides one day certain content is bad um, and it has to be necessary in order to respect the rights or reputations of others or for the protection of national security of public order or public health or morals. So under human rights law, in a way that's very different from the First Amendment, which um, has been interpreted over generations to provide very limited possibility for government restrictions. Under human rights law, there is room for some restriction on expression where you have a conflict with the rights of others or public health or national security as noted there. Okay, there's also one other area, Article 20 of uh, the International Covenant, that says that any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence shall be prohibited. There's an obligation here to deal with incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. There's also a set of principles out there that apply these norms to, to companies as well, and we can talk a little bit about that. So I'm gonna close here with just a few big questions, at least in my world, they're, they're big questions. One, for us, how should individual rights be protected on launch? It's also privacy, it's public health, it's public order. How should, how should the companies and how should governments be responding to the threats that we're talking about? How should people and communities be protected online? Uh, particularly given Lenora's um, uh, description of her experience, which I think is widespread, what should the rules be? What law, so put aside company rules, what law should govern online speech, if any law at all? And should it be law or should it be company policies and their terms of service that govern these kinds of issues? So. Peter, I'm sorry I went over a couple minutes. That's my rocket version of thinking about hate speech online. Thanks so much. No, thank you, David. It's wonderful to see a context, A, get an understanding in our own country, but also the way other uh, communities, countries have been coping with the challenge of what we call the Wild West of free speech. So. Um, Lenora, if you could unmute yourself, I'd like to engage both of you in a little conversation before we open it up for some Q&A. So Lenora, just to get things started, I wonder if you could just clarify a little bit for us what we all sort of understand stalking from the movies, right, uh, uh, in the world. But what does that look like online? Is it just unwanted text messages? And, you know, why don't you just delete those? What is the, help us understand what cyber stalking looks like and why it is so uh, destructive and impactful. Sure. Well, first, I have to also differentiate the difference between harassment and stalking. So like that's the, okay. the first one, right? So we can we can do that. Um, 
with, with stalking, it's considered a, a credible threat, right? And it's, it's seeping into your world and your life. So it's one thing if, you know, somebody writes something nasty to you, that's more on the harassment spectrum. But when it starts to carry, carry over, uh, you know, it, where they're honestly surveilling you, that's where it's starting to enter into the, the cyber stalking space. Okay, great. And it, just to follow up, when we see, when there's an experience of cyber stalking, what, is, what are the consequences for the person who, who's, who's stalked? Like what, what, what do they experience in their own lives? Sure, I mean, it's different for everybody. So I can only really speak to my experience with the victims that I've worked with. But as I said in 48 hours, for me, it felt like, you know, being held underwater, you're screaming and you're trying to get help and nobody's listening. Social media doesn't help you. People don't take you seriously. For me, it was the loss of a job, loss of personal relationships. Imagine if you're told, as I was, that I was gonna be gassed through my door every night. I have lifetime insomnia and PTSD from that. So, but it's different for everybody. You know, some people they're abused by revenge porn, or th there's like there's a huge umbrella of related crimes. So I I can't you know just narrow it down. But but essentially, when somebody's cyber stalking you, really they're they're trying to take away your freedom, your security. It's terrorism. It's terrorism to an individual. That's the easiest way I can explain it. Okay, great. No, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, David. You know, uh, follow up. Um, you put us out there like we have lots of rights that we're trying to protect, right? Right to privacy. We also have a right to free speech in this country and free expression. Uh, so, what are the standards we need to be looking at, like you know, for the United States? Uh, you know, and, and what what's been the history? Are we basically just relying on a free speech standard, or are we looking at criminal justice standards? Are we looking at privacy standards? What standards are not getting enough attention in this realm that really need to be uplifted to have a, uh, a robust but yet safe internet experience? Yeah, I, so, I mean, I think it's really important for us, you know, we're, we're all, I think we're all in California, even though we're virtual, you know, we, we're talking about companies, by and large, at least today, we're talking about American companies. And so, I think it's easy for us to imagine that it's just American law that should be governing here. But, you know, when you think about it, these are companies that are global and, and they're global in a massive way. You know, Facebook with its two and a half billion users, something like 85% of their users are outside the United States. So, you know, if we were to say, well, the First Amendment should apply or some other American set of legal norms should apply, you know, the 85% of their users from around the world, they could care less about the First Amendment, to be honest. And so I think when, when we think about what norms should apply, I mean, my, my view is the companies first have a responsibility to protect their users and to protect the public. Now, part of that might be protecting the right of freedom of expression, but, but you know, we often get lost in, the, in a First Amendment view that, that online thinks that well, the response to harassing speech is more speech. But that's, that's really not an effective tool because what harassing speech or doxing or other kinds of online attacks are about, they're about silencing other people. So if you think about it in those terms, First Amendment law doesn't really help us so much, but the human rights law framework that I mentioned before actually could provide a pretty good basis for thinking about not only what is the right to freedom of expression, but how is it protected? How do we protect that right, particularly when it's sometimes used as an assault on other rights? So what would that look like in the American system uh, what, to embrace that, that human rights uh, notion? Yeah, well, I mean, Government is, I think it's, it's extremely unlikely um, that government, whether we're talking about state of California or the federal government, will adopt law that imposes um, speech constraints on, on the companies or on users um, when, they're, you know, when they're engaging on the platforms. I think that's very unlikely in part because our, the way the First Amendment has been interpreted, it, you know, which is Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech, it's been interpreted in a very um, 
I mean, in a zealous way that I think as Americans, we can mostly be, be proud of, but it doesn't provide a real good basis for government regulation of that, um, uh, of that space. Right. So, so, what I, so what I think is, what we should be looking towards is two things. One is government can impose uh, greater transparency obligations on the companies. So not only do we see what their rules are, but we understand how they're implemented. And the other part is that the companies themselves should be basing their rules on human rights standards rather than just these terms of service, which are basically about you know, their business model and their business interests. Okay. All right, so uh, Lenora, you know, I'm curious, right? David just articulated a, my using my bully pulpit and my exercising free speech isn't enough if it's actually shutting people out, right? And you talked about you're not your voice, your career, which is really took, uh, you know, took, took negative turns based on the cyber stalking and harassment that you receive. So um, what are the gaps in the law that we have and, as an, and the legislation that you've been working towards? You know, what are you trying to get in place? Uh, tell us more about your legislative work now uh, and what are those gaps in the law and what you're doing? There's so many gaps in the law. I don't have the time to, to really get into it, to be honest. But, um, sure. Uh, so right now I'm working on what I hope to call the SAVE Bill, which stands for Stalking Abuse Victims Empowerment. And one of the biggest features that we hope to have is a restraining order registry. Because part of the thing is if you can stop the crime off at the pass before it happens. So t say you take a crime like Dirty John. We're all sort of familiar with that story. It's, it's been all over the news. It's actually a girlfriend of mine. You know, if you were able to look up somebody and see that they in fact had restraining orders, maybe you wouldn't go on that date, maybe you wouldn't have that relationship. And we've seen with the sex offender registry that it's been very effective. So if we could have a restraining order registry, that might be great. Um, another thing I'm trying to do is the electronic process and delivery of restraining orders, because even in, in my situation, I, I had ultimately 4,000 violations of the order, which police did not act on. That's another problem is because even when the laws exist, they're not always being acted on. That's a whole other situation. Um, so partially it's the process and the people don't understand how to navigate the system and even getting the restraining order can be really difficult for people but ultimately it's the serving of the restraining order if you don't have the person's address right so we have it there's you know we have legal precedent for things like foreclosure notices right we can do that don't we have something similar if you can send me a death threat over email why can't i send you a protective order to that same address and have it recognized right so yeah, so there's, there's, there's honestly, I could, I could speak all day and I, I don't have the time. So yeah. So a lot of it sounds like right in the res getting restraining orders. So you say that there's, there's been thousands of violations of the restraining order, right? What I'm used to a restraining order is, uh, or the, right, when they come too close to you or go outside your kid's school or your home, right. what does that look on? How do restraining orders does right. it re inhibit people's free speech online? Are they not allowed to post? What, right. what is it, what's right. the violation online look like? Each judgment is different. Every state has different criteria. So it could be different. So, so for me, in my protective order, he's not allowed to speak about me or do any of that. But one of the things I wanted to bring up with social media is I was brought on and I, I signed an ND, so I'm not going to name that institution, but a popular social media outlet. And one of the things I said to them is when I got my little blue check, I shared my ID. And, you know, so what I want to have is when, when you have a restraining order, people just create 8 million profiles. So even if, you know, my restraining order is against Peter Levi, you know, I could have 20, uh, you know, it's the same individual. And there, you have to get, obviously, you know, a, a warrant to get a subpoena to get the I, IP to even prove it's in fact the same individual. So what I'm hoping for is to try and get social media companies to play ball. And what I've asked them to do is, you know, much like I sent over my ID to get my blue check, why can't I send over my restraining order and you just give me the IP of the person who's sending me, and the criteria would be threats of harm, not harassment, you know, that, that sort of level, so that you could, you could actually, and I even, I even said there's going to be a murder that could have been prevented, and there's going to be a huge civil suit, so why don't you just participate in this way before we, we get there? So one thing I'm hearing from you, Lenora, is that there's a real difference between uh, what we would say, you know, in person and the online world, that uh, we, we, we just don't put on a, a new mask and show up in someone's life, right? Mm -hmm. Versus online, you can create hundreds of profiles and each one might require its own 
TRO, right? Its own restraining order. So David, go, jumping for you, right? When we're looking at those challenges, how can we protect this deep American value of freedom of speech, right? It's ensconced in the First Amendment to the Constitution. It, it, it's, it's near to us. How can we protect that and then protect people like Lenora and, and the many other folks uh, in, the, in the online world, right? Because I don't think the First Amendment was written with this understanding that a voice and expression has this depth and has this anonymity and has this level of uh, uh, impact on people's real lives, which often exist online and, as we say, IRL in the real world. Um, so what can we yeah, do? I, so I mean, I think that it's it's important to to think about these questions as I mean, there's different sorts of questions that are at issue here. I think what Lenora is describing is something that, generally speaking, I see it a, a little bit in the in the Q and A panel. I think it's generally we're, we're talking about about uh, attacks that we can understand as as crimes in the offline world. Right, so, so whether it's stalking or doxing, at least in, in, in California, those, those are actual crimes in physical space. So um, like from my perspective, it's not all that hard or shouldn't be all that hard for the companies to deal with that kind of, let's say content, if we're gonna give it the most, the blandest word. I think it's much harder when we're talking about political debate, and we're talking about things like hate speech, which hate speech as a concept is not subject to restriction under First Amendment law in the United States. Hate crimes are something different, right? So if you commit a crime with a, a racial or religious animus behind it, that's of course can be you know, cognizable by, by law, but Hate speech on its own is not. So oftentimes what we are asking the platforms to do is to take down content or to affix a fact check to content that government has no power in the United States at least to regulate. So we're, we're, asking, government, we're asking the companies to do something that, and, and we can talk a little bit about this, we're asking the companies to do something that maybe they should be doing, but it's not something that government can do. And it's not something that government can force companies to do. So we're in this very strange area when we're, when we're dealing with content that is, um, that is not harmful by legal standards. And yet people are really, I think, concerned about that. And I think, you know, there's really good examples from Trump from last week. You know, whether we're talking about, you know, disinformation around voting, which you know, I consider to be a real um, harm to the democratic right to vote, or we're talking about you know, his, his uh, tweet that uh, you know, basically I think could be understood as inciting people to shoot looters. You know, those are things that if we were in a court of law in the United States, it'd be very, very difficult to, um, to sustain shutting that down but the companies can. And so the question for us, and this is why it's so important, is what principles should the companies be, uh, be using when they're making those kinds of decisions? Okay, great, no, and I think I, uh, you ask, oh, put a really great question. When we talk about the platforms are private corporations, right? They're companies, they're not government entities. Uh, do they decide, is it a dialogue with uh, the, the, the public, with us, with the users, with the stockholders? These are really great questions. Uh, uh, I just want to say, I, I want to, eight, just thank you both uh, so far. We're going to now uh, open up to our question answer portion of the call. Just as a reminder, uh, if you're joining our call by computer today, um, please go to the Q&A option on the bottom of your computer to ask your questions. I know some people put them in the chat, uh, but also in the Q&A. I just want to direct you to put them into the Q&A. Um, and since it's happened a number of times, everyone wants to know, uh, particularly about Jack Dorsey and the Twitter Trump battle that has uh, been going on. So, uh, David, if you could just, you know, give us a little bit 
uh, more insight into this, you know? And once again, we're, we're not in the room making the decision. We're not the many little legislative panels at Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or the other online platforms. But if you were in that conversation in Twitter, right, with, with Jack Dorsey and his people about how are they making decisions? How should they be making decisions? What, sh quote, should they be doing? And I get you've already given us a variety of perspectives, but um, personally. Hmm. Yeah, so... Um... So I think it's important for us to see the companies as I think what we all see, which is massive power on our public space. And, and if you think about their power in the United States, it's actually pretty limited compared to their power in other places and other countries around the world. They are dominant. And in some places, you know, Facebook is the internet or Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube together are the public square in a way that, you know, we, we kind of talk about that in the United States, but I think it's a little bit overstating because in the United States, notwithstanding the power of the, the companies, we still have all sorts of, of other forums uh, to, to have discussion. So when, when the platforms are actually thinking through these questions, they're looking at their rules, but I think more and more today, they're also asking, what, what is the framework that we should adopt for making these decisions? And, and I think that if you looked at Twitter's deci decision making, or at least its decisions last week, I think that you can find them kind of articulated according to what I would think of as more of a human rights oriented standard than a First Amendment standard. Because what they were looking at, I mean, I don't know if they were specifically looking at this, but I think they were looking at this by saying on the one hand, Sure, President Trump, he's an American citizen. He has the right to, to free speech. Um, but at the same time, we are concerned that that speech might interfere with, you know, the right of a voter to know about the voting process or the, um, or the right of individuals to be free from physical harm, which is what that second tweet around incitement was. So, so I think that, that the company um, look, did a kind of analysis that whether it was explicitly human rights or not, they said, and, and you know, Twitter originally was, you know, the free speech wing of the free speech party. Um, and so they're coming at this from a very strong free speech um, posture. And I think they looked at it and said, look, we have, we have a, an array of rights to deal with. We want to protect as many of them as we can. We have tools to deal with them. Um, and these are the things that we can do. So what I'm, but you started off, David, by suggesting that that this is like the public square, the public space. Are you opening up that there should be a role for government because they wield uh, unwieldy power in a public space, even as private companies? That there should be a greater role of government? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I don't. I don't really want government to be making decisions about content. You know, I, I don't think, you know, I don't want government to be in there saying this is legitimate speech and this is not. But that's that's a different thing from saying governments can do a few things. They can do, um, they can impose disclosure requirements and transparency requirements so that we actually understand how the companies are making these decisions and so that the companies can be held accountable for these kinds of decisions. Um, we can be demanding that the companies apply human rights standards, for example, um, or at least take them into account, because I think that would address some of the issues that Lenora was talking about. So in the absence of, of other law, or as I think some of the questions suggested, we don't, often, we don't always know who the attacker is. So what's the responsibility of the company in that, in that context? Right. Well, I think the human rights standards, that's a way for government to say, we're not gonna deal with the content, but we want companies to be applying these norms. Sure, so to put it in your realm, Lenora, because you as an individual have been targeted in your personhood as well as your livelihood on these platforms. Uh, you know, what's your sense about uh, the terms of service, free speech, the role of government, and some of these standards that David has wonderfully articulated for us? Right, and that's, that's actually why I brought up social media and why I've been trying to interact with. I thought I would be a, a quicker more streamlined way to actually have change, right? And so I, I have been consulting with them. And there's there's been some pushback, but you know, that's why I'm 
for example, I'm public with my story to, to apply this pressure and working with people like ADL because we have the power to do that. We have the power to, you know, really squeeze it and make them understand. Okay, great. So I know a lot of questions have come in and Dan, uh, our civil rights chair, Dan Tarman for our region is going to moderate those questions for us. So uh, if you want to ask away. Sure. Hi, everybody. And uh, just as a time check, unfortunately, we only have six minutes left. So we're not going to get to the multitude of questions that have come in. Uh, and I'm going to try to synthesize a little bit uh, and, and further direct the conversation. Uh, and the first one uh, is based on what we've been talking about and some questions have, have come in directed towards David. Uh, David, last week, uh, the, the president signed an executive order threatening some regulation of the social platforms. Now, recognizing that that was a probably a brazen political move, can you just comment on that and what the implications are from a federal policy perspective uh, and where, uh, where that discourse, if it was done constructively, might go? Yeah, um, so uh, first off, I think the executive order will have very limited legal impact. Um, and I think we should understand what the president was doing not as a kind of technical legal issue, but as an attempt to, to dominate uh, the platforms, to intimidate them, not to um, de-amplify, uh, to, not to restrict his speech. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's how we should understand what he was doing. I think it's also, it's clearly a political distraction, but it's also a distraction from the real regulatory conversation that we should have in the United States. You know, to what extent should we be thinking about um, competition law and antitrust? I mean, these are enormous companies. Um, to what extent should we be talking about other responsibilities of the companies to deal with content? Um, and, and I think the president um, and, and honestly, Republicans over the past couple of years have kind of muddied that discussion to a certain extent and made it harder to, to have a real legitimate discussion under the First Amendment, but also under sort of basic standards of uh, what we expect from companies that have this kind of power. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, is to Lenora, but also to you as, as well, David. And again, it's, it's based on something that someone uh, wrote, but, and also the comments from you, Lenora. You know, we, we've just spent some time talking about regulating powerful people, um, but it, it's also clear that there are countless uh, victims like Lenora who uh, have you know no political power you know what is the recourse what is the real recourse for people like lenora who have even less of a voice than her less privilege than her um you know we've we've heard about the uh, difficulties of getting um uh, restraining orders uh, enforced and paid attention to uh and so you know what is the recourse and and you know ultimately you know where is the standard of liability of these platforms if something goes from incitement to uh, behavior that, that harms somebody physically. Lenora? Right, that, that, that's exactly my point. I, I mean, I, I made it very clear to that institution that I had the, the consultation with that, you know, they could prevent a homicide or many other crimes and they're, they're choosing not to. So it's, this is a, it's a very sticky thing. And as far as, you know, what, what people can do, I, I have to explain this. I had 4,000 violations of my restraining order. I have done everything. My, my detective always said I was the best possible victim. No one is more vigilant than me, right? So this is, this is they're, they're not moving forward. And then as far as with social media, a really terrible crime that, that could have been stopped, I think, for people to take the next step and actually you know, treat it as I believe they should. David, do you, do you have a thought on that from a, from a legal scholarly perspective? Yeah, I mean, first off, I think that, um, that all too often the companies don't act when there are allegations of, of harassment and crime uh, or potential crime uh, or threats. So, so there does need to be better behavior by the, by the companies. The, of course, the problem is, is often that, um, you know, how we constrain legal tools to deal with that can be extremely problematic, especially in the United States under, under a First Amendment framework. So in a way, kind of reorienting towards the harms rather than just the speech is one way to think about how, how um, and I think that's, 
some of the law that Lenore was talking about is trying to do that, that can be helpful in, in focusing the minds of, of the companies. Gotcha. Um, you know, we're just about out of time. Um, and I, I want to just uh, maybe one final question uh, that's come up several times, which it might be a little bit repetitive, but, but I do think it's important. And then we'll have to close this out. Um, you know, the, the notion of common law assault and that if something were to happen in, you know, in the real world, in the offline world, it would be clearly a violation of the law. Uh, why don't those rules seem to apply when something is done through an online platform? I mean, I, I brought that up yesterday. I brought up this sort of hypothetical. If I was to get an unsolicited penis photo versus someone flashing me on the street, right? Why, why it's ultimately the same crime, right? You're still, you're still having that experience. Um, that's, that's a great question and, and one that, you know, as a victim, I'm constantly bringing forward. I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, legally. As, like, like, I'm trying here. I, I'm not the constitutional law scholar. My friend gave me the Chairminsky book. I'm trying, but that's not my, my background. <laughs> so I'll leave it up to you guys. I'm just, I'm just coming from the victim perspective, which is um, an angry, sad place that wants change. So I'll, I'll let you answer that one. Is flashing in the real world the same as sending people explicit material online? That, well, that's what I'm saying. It's the yeah, same. Legally, should it be? Data. That's why. That's why I, I mentioned that exact yeah. scenario eight million times. It should be, but we don't treat it that way. We so we usually don't treat it that way, but it can be. I mean, one of the problems. I think it goes back to, um, and I support that. I mean, I think that we should have just as we think that human rights offline should also apply online. We should think of it in the opposite way or the 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 kind of converse way as well, which is harms offline can also be harms that are, are caused online. So there shouldn't there should be ways to analogize and by law to to bring those things together. So the, the question is really great. The problem often is that to, is that governments do not regularly define the harms in a narrow enough way that allow for the companies to know what's illegal and what's not, or what's a harm and what's not. And the, the result of this, maybe less in the United States than, than globally, but the result is often that the companies are over enforcing laws and they end up taking down a lot of content that is fully legitimate. And so it's not a problem of principle. I mean, the idea that, that common law harms should apply online, that's, that's, I agree, that is a place we could go. The problem is that governments all too often just don't do their job. They, they define too generally. They don't enforce well enough. They don't provide transparency requirements. And we end up with, or the penalties are extremely high. And then these third parties, so not the individual who committed the crime, but the third parties, the platforms, end up over-regulating. And that's, that ultimately is the place that we're really focusing on, on which is how do we ensure that we address the harms, but we don't address them in such a way that we undermine the rights that we all want to enjoy. Great. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, we're we're at time. You know, a couple of quick closing remarks. You know, the we have teed up some extraordinarily important issues about the kind of society that we live in, the kind of society that we want to live in, humanization versus dehumanization, and the need for us to understand each other and to see each other whether we're in the online world or the offline world. And so it's obviously, it's, it's an integral conversation for us to be having as individuals and as a community. We thank you all, uh, our panelists, uh, for your contributions, Lenora, and particularly for sharing your truth, uh, as difficult as it is. Um, and uh, again, this has been recorded. It'll be available online. Uh, and hopefully, we'll be able to continue this conversation uh, together going forward. Thank you. Everybody have a very good afternoon.